Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, in this short 30 minutes, we're going to try to cram in a lot of information, so please bear with us. We'll have three presenters. Um, I'll be the first. My name is Lori Steffi. I'm a scientific data architect, and you will also be hearing from Daniel Markall and Roland Thomas. Okay, so what we're going to try to cover here is um, general Python advice. A lot of this will apply to both Cori and Perlmutter. We're going to talk about using Python on GPUs. I'm sure a topic many of you are curious about. We'll talk about using Jupyter uh, on Perlmutter. And we're going to try really hard to leave about five minutes at the end for an open Q&A. So this will be a good opportunity for you to ask us questions. All right, so let's get started. Um, I assume most of you have used Cori. Um, so there are a few differences, and we'll, I'll try to highlight the most important things here. Um, one thing hopefully you'll notice and like is that we'll have a more uniform uh, Python and Jupyter environment. So the Python Jupyter 3 kernel will be based on the current default Python module. So um, right now that it's a little bit different, but this uh, should make it easier to keep track of your packages. Also, uh, the kernel will now have the environment variable Python user base, which means that it will be able to find uh, pip packages. So this also will result in um, more uniform behavior, and, and Roland can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, that said, many of the kind of best practices we've been advertising on Quarry are still in effect. So for good performance, uh, you can install your software stack on our global common file system. Um, this is a project-based file system, so you don't have your own uh, directory, but you can install in your projects directory. Um, if you run out of space and a ticket, we can try to get you more. Um, another best practice is to use a custom Conda environment for um, any kind of software you need that is not in the module we provide. This is a nice sandbox. It's easy to get rid of if something goes wrong. Um, and it's also very easy to use in Jupyter uh, via the IPython kernel uh, conversion. And finally, of course, we are still encouraging shifters, especially at large scale. Uh, and this is also easily used in Jupyter um, as a kernel. So if you need help with this, please let us know. Oh, and finally, Perlmutter has uh, 6,000 GPUs. So of course, uh, taking advantage of those will be a little different. OK, so these are some common problems we've seen people running into so far on Cori and Perlmutter. Um, hopefully, what we tell you can help avoid some of these issues. <laughs> Uh, so first, these systems are sharing file systems, and that means a lot of um, system customizations, like in your dot .files, for example, uh, will be shared. You most likely don't want the same kinds of software packages and environments on these systems, so be careful. First of all, um, try not to put too much in your dot .file, and if you do, you need to periodically review it, make sure you still want it. Um, if you put system specific things in there, you might shoot yourself in the foot. Um, the next thing is if you're building custom environments, most likely you'll want to keep a separate set for Curry and Poor Mother. Um, MPI for Pi, for example, will definitely not work um, from one system to the other. So you'll want to maintain uh, separate installs. One tip is to append the system name uh, to your environment so you can keep track. But of course, you can do this however you like. And uh, PIP can be a little more dangerous now with these shared systems, so we'll cover that. OK, so one big change on Perlmutter now, and actually coming shortly to Perlmutter, is that you'll finally be able to use the conda activate command. Some of you may be familiar with our current setup, which requires uh, either source activate, um, which is here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, so this is the current setup or um, using a conda init conda activate, which is not so good because it adds customization to your batch RC. Uh, so now the new setup, which is on Perlmutter today, you can just load the Python module and conda activate and deactivate with no uh, changes to your setup. So that's great. Please try it out. Um, if you want to know more, we have some pending updates to the docs that you can check out. All right, so for parallels, uh, achieving parallelism, MPI for Pi is a very common library. And so a lot of our user questions have been around how do I build and use MPI for Pi? Uh, so we provide it in uh, the Python module. So it's already there, you can load it and test it out. But if you're gonna build your own, like I think many of you will, this is the recipe that we have uh, iterated on and settled upon for now. 
So we recommend the GNU programming environment because at least last I tried, we can't build MPI for Pi with the NVIDIA compilers. You'll need CUDA toolkit and Python, of course. Build your custom environment. You'll need this flag here um, so that you can access the GPU. And finally, uh, there's some other stuff in here we'll talk about on the next slide. So note that when you've built MPI for Pi with CUDA support, it will ask for the CUDA libraries at runtime. So even if you're running CPU only code, you will still need the CUDA toolkit mod or library loaded in in the path. Um, it's a little bit weird, but that's how it works. Okay, and finally, be careful with PIP. PIP will try to be clever and help you. And it will search our shared file systems for packages and say, oh, hey, like I found an MPI for Pi, let's use that. But if it's finding one that you built on Cori, you won't want that because it doesn't work. So be careful. The best practices for PIP, in my opinion, are that you should use PIP within a custom environment. So it's within your sandbox, you know exactly where it is. If you get rid of your environment, you've also gotten rid of your package. It makes it easier. Also, when you're PIP installing, use the force flag. This will force a rebuild. So it will prevent them, it will prevent PIP from using packages on the wrong system. This appeared in our MPI for Pi recipe. Okay, finally, if you do use PIP user, and I know some of you do, it will install to places specified uh, by the Python user base environment variable. That's here. So this is in uh, your search path as defined in the module, which can be a little bit tricky depending on how you've set up your environment. So it's safe to delete this at any time uh, if you want to clean up or save space. And now we'll move on to Daniel Margal. Hi, thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, so today I hope to just give in a couple of minutes um, a, a few, I'll present a few slides on how to get started um, with GPUs in Python on, on the NERSC systems, in particular. Perlmutter. Um, so the first thing, um, so starting um, in Python, you're probably familiar with NumPy and SciPy libraries that sort of form the, the backbone of scientific computing ecosystem in Python. And so those, those libraries um, don't use utilize GPUs out of the box, um, but there are many Python GPU frameworks out there. Um, some of the very popular ones kind of serve as drop-in replacements to those core backbone libraries uh, like NumPy and SciPy, as well as Pandas and Scikit-learn. So those, those popular GPU frameworks are, are KuPy, um, and there's also a number of them in the, the Rapids library uh, ecosystem. There's also KuNumeric, um, which is not currently available or, or working on, on Perlmutter, but it's, it's something that aims to be a drop-in replacement for, for NumPy, but also scale across many, many G GPUs. There's also the popular machine learning libraries, such as PyTorch and TensorFlow, that also support a lot of general GPU computing um, features, such as working with um, array data structures and, and performing linear algebra operations on those. So if your application is already utilizing PyTorch or TensorFlow, those, those could be good entry points into to, to leveraging GPUs and other parts of your application as well. And then if you really want to write your own GPU kernels, um, there are a number of, of libraries that will, that will let you do that as well from your Python code. Um, so some of those are, are Numba, PyOpenCL, and PyCuda. Um, and one nice thing about some of these libraries in the ecosystem in general, um, well, I guess it's, it, there's kind of two sides to it. There's, all of these libraries are kind of, you know, they're, they're trying to accomplish different things and they've implemented things in different ways. And so some of them are better at certain things than others. And so there's a lot of trade-offs that you have to consider when choosing a framework. Um, there is some effort um, in various places to try to coordinate and, and kind of share a common data structure format so you can pass um, these array structures that are created in these different libraries between each other. Um, and then there's also some effort in the community community to kind of standardize what it means to have an, an array API. So on, on the right here, um, there's a little screenshot of the uh, API for the 
mean or average function from a bunch of these libraries, and they all have a slightly different interface. Um, so that could be a little bit of a headache when trying to mix and match these various libraries. Um, but the good news is that there's there's some effort to to coordinate and improve that going forward. Um, <clears throat> so getting started on ProButter, um, as Laurie mentioned, um, you'll want to load use the the CUDA toolkit and Python modules, and you can. You start by um, loading those modules and you have to pay attention to the version that's brought in from the CUDA toolkit module. So in this case here, I'm highlighting that the version of CUDA is 11.4 currently by default. Um, so that's important. For example, if you wanted to use CUPI, when you install CUPI, you have to make sure you specify the version that corresponds to, to CUDA. Um, and then it's just as, as simple as that. As after installing CuPy, you can kind of import CuPy as CP, just as you would import NumPy as NP, and you can create an array on the GPU device and print that out. So there's just a few lines of code, and you're already doing GPU computing in Python. Um, <clears throat> and so here's one more kind of the next step is how do you you know move data between the CPU and GPU device. So as was mentioned earlier today, it's an important consideration to keep in mind when you're thinking about GPU and just doing heterogeneous CPU, GPU programming in general, you have to keep, keep this idea of where your, where your data is uh, on the CPU or on the GPU. Um, so here are just a few commands that kind of show how you can do that data movement in using CuPy. Um, and I don't think we have time to really go into kind of this more advanced GPU programming, but you, you can do things. This, this slide here is meant to kind of show an example of, of writing your own kind of lower level kernels using, using the number um, just in time compilation to, to write a kernel. Um, and then also how you can use mix and match these kind of number and CuPy, as well as using kind of this generalized uh, array API um, to operate on that, that data as well. Um, another thing that's very useful as you're kind of starting off and trying to understand what your what your GPU code is actually doing is, is to visualize uh, is to to run a profiler and visualize what's what's actually happening running on the GPU versus CPU. Um, so you can use um, the NVIDIA Insight Systems profiling tool to um, profile your application, um, and you can use the kind of standard NVTX markers and ranges to to decorate your code. Um, and add your own labels that you would be able to visualize in the, the profiler. So this is really helpful to do when you're kind of first porting applications or trying to understand the performance. It's really helpful to use a profiling tool. So I just wanted to plug that. <clears throat> and finally, you're probably wondering if you're just getting started, is, is my code a good fit for a GPU? So there was a lot of discussion about this in the presentations earlier today. And so just reiterating some of those points. So CPUs, are good at doing things very quickly. They're kind of low latency, and GPUs are better at high throughput. So on the right here, I've kind of done just illustrated um, a very simple um, benchmark of just doing the dot product between two matrices at various sizes and comparing the, the processing time using NumPy or, or CuPy. And so NumPy um, has a lower processing time for small uh, array sizes, um, but at a, at a certain scale above 200 or so here on the size, um, the CuPy version is much faster. And so here you can kind of see the, the overhead um, of running things on a GPU is only worth it at, at larger array sizes. And so if you have more questions, there's kind of more discussion about this for, for, specific, for Python applications specifically in the nurse documentation, um, or if you, you want to, you can open a ticket as well. Next up will be Roland talking about Jupyter on Perlmutter. Hi, uh, I'm Roland Thomas. I'm from the um, Data Science Engagement Group at NERSC now. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Jupyter on Perlmutter, what you need to know 
uh, moving from Cori to Perlmutter. Um, I've got about seven slides to answer kind of three high level questions that I think everybody will be on people's minds. Um, these are basically, how do I make sure that I can run notebooks on Perlmutter phase one? How do I actually make sure that I'm using the GPUs um, from Jupyter um, on Perlmutter? And is there anything special that you need to keep in mind when moving workflows from Cori to Perlmutter using Jupyter? All right, so um, the first thing you'll need to do is just make sure that you can access Perlmutter with Jupyter by logging in at jupyter.nurse.gov. Um, and if you could advance um, to the animation just real quickly. Um, what you ought to see when you log in and go to the home or the console page um, is this extra new row above um, the Cori set of buttons. There should be probably three buttons there for you. If that row doesn't show up for you, then what's needed is for you to be to have Perlmutter added to your list of server logins in Iris. Um, if you can't figure out how to get that done, um, file a, you can file a ticket. You, everybody here in the training probably should be able to see this line of buttons. Um, next slide. All right. Um, what do the different buttons actually do when you click them? Um, the far left button uh, labeled shared shared CPU node uh, on Perlmutter. Um, what that does is that's the equivalent of running on the Cori shared CPU node. Um, it's just that it's on Perlmutter. So these are shared login nodes. Um, they are not char your usage is not charged and will not be charged uh, in the future. There are no limits currently on CPU, GPU, or memory uh, usage right now, unlike on Cori. You can use uh, this configuration mainly for debugging, testing, and developing Jupyter notebooks. Um, things that are not supposed to be kind of compute intensive or really long running things, that's really um, more for jobs. Um, the middle button, exclusive GPU node, what that does is that gets you a, a, a notebook running on um, a Perlmutter phase one compute node all to yourself. Uh, when we start charging, um, the account that will be charged will be some sensible default. It might be your default GPU account uh, if we have something like that. Um, there's a six hour time limit there. So you can run a notebook for up to, up to six hours, which is the longest uh, you can run a job right now on Perlmutter anyway. This is good for interactive GPU work where you're um, using the GPUs a lot. Um, and things that maybe need to run a little bit longer. So things that are maybe kind of more compute intensive, um, some things that will not fit in the resources you get on the shared node. And then finally, the button all the way to the right uh, pops up uh, a menu that allows you to configure the parameters of the job that your notebook is going to be running in. And this is a way for you to be able to use more than one node. Um, you can use up to four nodes, so 16 GPUs here. Um, you can customize how your slurm allocation works. If you don't want to use your default um, your default account, you can switch to another account, use a reservation or whatever. Uh, what you want to use this for is when you need to scale up to using multiple nodes. Um, if four nodes turns out to not be enough for your needs, please contact me. I'd love to hear about your needs and, and we can work on, on um, getting you the resources you want to use. Uh, next slide. Um, Again, uh, how do you actually make use of the GPUs? What do you actually have? Um, on the login nodes, um, I think it was mentioned probably earlier in the training, there is one kind of shared uh, A100 on the login nodes. Right now it's kind of a free for all. Um, so if you're using it, you're the person using it. If somebody else is using it, you're not gonna be able to use it. In the future, we might have multi-instance uh, GPU set up on, um, on the login nodes uh, so that more people could use the GPU actually uh, interleave work uh, on the GPU uh, more cleanly. Um, the exclusive login, uh, the exclusive GPU node gets you four A100s. And then of course, on the configurable uh, option, you can have up to 16 uh, A100s. Next slide. And how do you make sure that you're actually using uh, the GPUs on the node that you're actually on. So you've probably seen NVIDIA SMI. You can do that from the notebook. You can do that from the terminal tab in Jupyter Lab. There is a lab extension that we have installed. Um, there's this kind of funny uh, icon. I think it's a GPU card. It's supposed to depict a GPU card. It's the third icon down on the side, on the left-hand side of the Jupyter Lab um, user interface there. 
If you click that, what you'll see are a few different dashboards that you can open up for GPU utilization, memory consumption, um, PCIe throughput, and things like that. Um, this lets you monitor GPU usage on the node that you're on. So it doesn't let you see other GPU usage of GPUs on other nodes in your allocation. Um, you need to do something different if you want to see a graphical representation of that right now. Uh, next slide. If you're a user of Python who likes to use the Dask framework for distributed parallelism, uh, we it is possible to use the Dask dashboard to monitor everything that's happening in your cluster, uh, observe progress, uh, profile your workflow, which is really what it's for. Right now, the way that you need to do that is you need to open up a separate browser tab and then um, copy the URL into the URL search bar for that. However, um, there is another lab extension um, that we used to have installed a long time ago, but was kind of problematic. Um, the issues with that lab extension are just now being addressed. And so we'll probably be putting the Dask lab extension into the, um, the maybe the next deployment of the Jupyter Lab stack that we do. And that will provide a similar kind of interface to what you can get from NV dashboard, which is what I showed on the previous slide, um, except it'll let you see all of the activity happening across all the nodes you're using in your Dask cluster. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, what are the high level things you should know moving uh, you know, as a Jupyter user from Cori to Perlmutter. Um, one big difference is that on the shared node notebook uh, configuration on Cori, there's only four nodes dedicated to Jupyter use that are repurposed login nodes, basically. Um, out of all 24 login nodes, we took four um, and set those aside for Jupyter use. And so about 250 users usually on a daily basis are kind of crammed into those four nodes. And so there's CPU and memory limits in place. Uh, to keep those nodes um, healthy. On the Perlmutter side, there are many more login nodes, there are 40 login nodes, and we don't restrict Jupyter Notebooks to any particular subset of those nodes right now. Um, so that means that Jupyter Notebooks run alongside SSH-based um, login sessions. We don't have any resource limits in place right now, so all kinds of fun things can happen there. Um, on the exclusive and configurable notebook side of things, um, on the exclusive node notebooks on the CPU side on Cori, if you've used that, you might have noticed it's a little bit flaky. The number of resources that are available are is actually pretty small, and you need to ask to be let into a special QoS to access those. On Perlmutter, Jupyter jobs are much more first class. Um, when you click the exclusive node button, you really shouldn't wait too long to get a notebook that starts up. We have no plans for, for requiring people to have access to a special QoS for that. We're keeping an eye on the allocation success rate. So when you request a Jupyter notebook um, from the hub in on a compute node, are you actually going to be able to get that quickly? Or do you have issues with that? We're keeping an eye on that. And we'll make adjustments to Q policy um, to try to keep that as uh, responsive as possible. Last point I want to make here is uh, to touch on setting up your your uh, Python, sorry, your your Jupyter kernels. Um, of course, on Cori, all the documentation that's there, that's on the Jupyter, um, sorry, on the Jupyter page on docs.nurseco, all of that basically still applies to Perlmutter that applied previously to Cori. Um, one thing that you'll probably notice is that as you put in um, things like the NVIDIA libraries, um, sorry about the background, my, my, my daughter's at home doing school today, I don't know if you can hear her. Um, your Conda environments will pick up a lot more uh, kind of bigger libraries and um, you, you may need to avail yourself of using the Google Common, uh, the Global Common software file system. Right, that's it for me. Okay, thanks. So I'll just um, quickly wrap up and try to point you all in a helpful direction. So we have a lot of documentation. We've been updating our docs almost daily now since we've installed Perlmutter. So we hope you find them helpful. Some of the pages you might check out are just the general Perlmutter page. We have a whole page about Python. So this talks about Conda environments, Conda channels. Um, we have Python on Perlmutter where we point out system specific things you should know about most of what we just talked about here. The Jupyter page Roland just mentioned, 
And uh, we have a pretty handy search bar. So check it out. You can type in <laughs> MPI for Pi and, and find what you need pretty quickly. And if you can't find what you need in your docs, um, please submit a ticket. We're very friendly and uh, we, we want to help you and make sure you can get your work done. So in summary, welcome. Um, we are here to help and make sure you can get uh, make productive use of this brand new exciting system. Um, check out our docs, file a ticket, and I think we left a few minutes for questions. So we're all here um, if you have questions about GPUs, Jupyter, or just general Python.